I think we'll start, we'll start now. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for coming uh, to this evening's Morton Psychedelic Society talk. Um, if any of you would like to be on our mailing list that aren't already, uh, there's a piece of paper at the front there in the corner, so do, do leave us your mail and your email address if, you, if you'd like to join our list. Uh, this evening we are delighted to, uh, to be hosting Dr. Ido, Ido Hartogson, um, who did his PhD on the role of uh, set and setting in shaping psychedelic culture and research in the 50s and 60s. Um, and is going to be uh, telling us about this uh, this interesting subject. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me here. <laughs> I'm very excited to be in a psychedelic society. That's uh, something. It's exciting to know that this is even a thing. It exists. Um, well, today I'm going to be talking. Um, Actually, it's an extension of my PhD research and um, based on a paper that uh, will be published soon about the history of set and setting, the history and future of set and setting. Um, so, my topic is really uh, one of the most basic issues in psychopharmacology, yet it is also a grey and largely uncharted area. Um, the topic of extra pharmacological or non pharmacological factors which shape drug effects. And there is a good reason why this topic is at the fringes of psychopharmacology, extra pharmacological factors which shape drug effects. And the reason is with that the psychopharmacology deals specifically with the effects of drugs on the mind, it does not deal with the effects of non drug factors. So it's by definition outside of psychopharmacology, but at the same time, as it turns out, non-drug effects are really uh, play a crucial role in shaping in shaping uh, drug effects, not drug factors, sorry. So what I want to argue here today is that uh, non-drug factors can actually uh, dramatically alter drug experiences. They can turn an experience from a positive experience into a negative experience or a negative experience into a positive experience. They can enhance the drug's effects or they can reduce them and they can dramatically alter addiction rates and abuse rates. So I would explore the topic of non-drug factors by looking at the theory of sense setting, uh, its history, the history of sense setting and its implications for future research and, um, and drug policy. Okay, so what is set and setting? Uh, how many of you, by the way, are familiar with the term? Okay, yeah, that's good. We're, we're in a psychedelic society, so I, I would hope that uh, this, um, this uh, concept into, to which I've uh, dedicated uh, the past uh, five or six years of my life uh, um, receives attention. And um, the basic idea is really that uh, drug effects are um, shaped crucially by psycho psychological factors or set and by uh, social or sociological factors or setting, environmental factors, uh, really, because, yeah, it's not always social ones. So when you come to think of it, this idea is really quite intuitive. After all, our experience in the world is generally shaped by psych psychological factors and environmental factors. But the set and setting uh, principle is particularly important in the case of psychedelics, which amplify or magnify meaning. So research shows that uh, psychedelics enhance suggestibility. Uh, they make an individual's experience particularly susceptible to outside factors. And because experiences tend to be particularly dramatic on psychedelics, it is crucial, uh, the kind of phenomena that we encounter in these states are particularly crucial. <laughs> okay, so, although the concept of set and setting only emerged in the early 1960s, it tr its roots actually go way back and uh, the pr these principles were known to hallucinogenic drug using cultures from time immemorial um, so traditional shamanic rituals often employed uh, a wide spectrum of techniques which were used 
to direct one's experience. One's experience. Uh, such techniques might include uh, whistles, smoke puffing, chants, or the use of uh, various ritual objects, such as icons, stones, or pipes. So um, this is uh, um, also was a kind of like psychedelic society uh, back in Paris in the 1840s. Do people here know the Parisian club, the Hashishins? Does anybody know them? So um, when Hashish was introduced to 19th century Europe, the principles of set and setting were quickly rediscovered by such bohemians as uh, Charles Baudelaire here on the right side and uh, Théophile Gautier there on the left side. And together with other literary luminaries of the 19th century, uh, Baudelaire and Gautier were uh, part of this uh, bohemian club called the um, Club de Hashishins, uh, which um, was dedicated to the pleasures of hashish eating. And these guys were experimenting with very high doses of uh, hashish. They were eating uh, often 8 or 16 grams of it at a time of hashish, which would cause some um, full-blown psychedelic experiences. And they quickly realized the, the, the importance of the setting around them. And this is what Gautier, the guy on the left, had to say about this. So, um, if it... Yeah, if one wishes to enjoy to the full magic of hashish, it is necessary to prepare in advance and furnish in some way the motif to its extravagant variations and disorderly fantasies. It is important to be in a tranquil frame of mind and body, to have on this day neither anxiety, nor fi anxiety duty, nor fixed regime, and to find oneself in such an apartment as Baudelaire and Edgar Poe love, a room furnished with poetical comfort, bizarre luxury, and mysterious elegance, a private and hidden retreat. Without these precautions, the ecstasy is likely to turn into nightmare, pleasure changes to suffering, joy to terror, a terrible anguish seizes one by the heart and breaks one with its fantastically enormous weight. So these were the warnings uh, from the 19th century about the importance of set and setting. But uh, the principles of set and setting were largely forgotten and neglected in the literature over the next 100 years, uh, with one uh, notable exception uh, being the work of German psychopharmacologist uh, Louis Levine, who wrote about the concept of toxic equation. Uh, the idea there was that uh, drug effects are um, shaped by the lesser or greater sensibility of individuals uh, to a certain drug. Uh, Levine also wrote about the drug effects being determined by climate or even by race, uh, ideas that are no longer part of the set and setting um, um, hypothesis today, but he left out a lot of the most basic factors of set and setting, such as the expectation, the intention, the social environment or the cultural environment, all factors that we'll get to uh, shortly. So then, in the night, only in the 1950s, uh, with the rise of uh, hallucinogenic drug research, uh, researchers started paying attention to question of non-drug factors. And in the Boston Psychopathic Hospital, uh, psychiatrist Robert Hyde conducted research in which he uh, modified experimental conditions over a period of three years. So in the first year, the conditions were generally, uh, generally varied, uh, changed randomly. Then in the second year, uh, subjects were uh, obligated to take a lot of tasks and, uh, and tests. And they were also, um, and the staff was, uh, staff behaved in an impersonal way with subjects. And then in the third year, there was a more relaxed environment. Subjects were uh, allowed more to choose their own activities. And the staff was more friendly and uh, gave more human, uh, human, there was more human contact. So the results were quite conclusive. Uh, in the first year, there was the severity of effects was uh, 3.4. In the second year, it was uh, the, the bad sense, I think, let's say it's, uh, it was, uh, 
it was for the level of severity of negative reactions to LCD, and then in the third year, severity was 2.8. Uh, it might sound curious, by the way, uh, for us to talk about the effects of LSD as uh, the level of severity of effects, but we need to remember that these guys studied LSD uh, as part of the psychotic, uh, part of the psychotic mimetic uh, paradigm, which viewed these drugs as basically, essentially, psychosis-inducing drugs. So this is how they viewed their uh, effects as either more psychotic or less psychotic. So I also demonstrated that uh, in 88% of the cases where subjects um, uh, needed to perform tests and where they were also exhibited to groups of medical students, this exacerbated uh, negative reactions. But in 85% uh, of the cases where subjects were allowed to choose their own uh, tasks and in which um, uh, and they were in a group of peers, uh, then there was um, better reaction to the drug or less severe reactions. Um, well, at the same time as Hyde was looking at the levels of severe reactions to LSD, um, some uh, psychedelic or hallucinogenic drug investigators who were interested in the uses of these drugs for, um, for therapy started looking at how these different factors could be used in order to uh, optimize hallucinogenic drug experiences and to make them as positive as possible. So the first person to, uh, to employ non-drug factors in a, in a constructive way or seven setting in a constructive way was this guy in the middle, Alfred Hubbard, who uh, is widely known as the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. He conducted the uh, ceremonies or sessions for thousands of uh, of individuals in the 1950s. He wasn't a, an academic researcher, he came from uh, uh, from the OSS, from the intelligence uh, field. Uh, but he he made some break breakthroughs in this um, in, in this uh, in this way and he influenced a lot of early psychedelic uh, researchers researchers such as uh, Betty Eisner here and Humphrey Osmond who started the um, paying closer attention to such factors as the selection of music, the arrangement of the space, and the guidance principles or the impo importance of post-session support. Another vital contribution was given by uh, Canadian anthropologist Anthony Wallace. And Wallace pointed to the importance of more general factors of cultural setting. setting. And he, he looked at the, he pointed to the great incongruency in the reactions of whites who participated in clinical research on masculine and the reactions of Indians who took part in um, peyote ceremonies, uh, peyote rituals, uh, masculine being the active agent in uh, a peyote. So really uh, there were quite different reactions between these two groups. So for uh, Caucasians in uh, clinical experiments, uh, there were extreme mood swings between uh, euphoria and depression and anxiety. And for, uh, for Indians in uh, ritual use, there were no such um, mood swings, there was, um, but there was satisfaction and religious awe. Then again, uh, white subjects exhibit, exhibited some sexual disinhibition and aggression, but um, Indian uh, participants in ceremonies uh, kept their proper behavior. Then uh, white uh, subjects in, uh, in experiments uh, showed some unwelcome mental phenomena, depersonalization, uh, suspicions bordering on paranoia, and the uh, split personality, for example, and again, uh, no such thing in, uh, in ritual ceremonies. On the other hand, the white subjects had no therapeutic effect, uh, while the Indian uh, participants uh, reported the feeling of connecting with a higher, deeping order of, of existence, and that the experience helped their integration into the community. So Wallace surmised that the reason for this uh, incongruency was the cultural environment in which uh, these experiences took place. 
and he suggested a number of parameters that uh, determine this cultural environment. So uh, one uh, central uh, parameter was the um, how is how are hallucinations and hallucinogenic drug experiences in particular um, conceived? So uh, are they conceived as gibberish or something meaningless? Or alternatively, are they conceived as something that could be meaningful for the individual and maybe also for the whole society? Um, and a second one was, do, does the person having the hallucination need to conceal his experience uh, because they, they might fear uh, punishment or can they share it with the people around them? So a person that, um, that believes that the hallucination or hallucinogenic experience could be uh, meaningful and could be revered and, and appreciated by the society around them is much, likely, much more likely to have a positive reaction than somebody who believes that uh, this is basically a symptom of a psychotic state and that he needs to uh, make this a secret from the people around him, which would, uh, a situation which would contribute to having suspicions, paranoia, and all these kinds of, uh, of uh, reactions. And while suggested that Western hallucinators actually suffered a great deal of unnecessary uh, damage and, and, and um, and difficulties because of Western psychiatry automatic association of hallucinations with um, with mental illness. Uh, so, in contrast to the native hallucinator who was accepted by their society, the Western hallucinator needed to conceal their experience out of fear of punishment, leading them uh, to more uh, negative reactions. So, um, twenty years later. In the end of the 60s, a period that was uh, labeled by some as the age of paranoia. Um, um, this actually did cause, uh, according to some, to a sharp rise in uh, the rate of bad trips. So a, a sociologist, Richard Bunce, uh, 20 years after Wallace, wrote a paper uh, about that sharp rise of, of bad trips. And where he claims that uh, the reason for that was the... Yeah, the worsening set and setting conditions, uh, the very bad publicity that LSD was getting at the time. People were being told if you take LSD, you will have flashback chromosome damage, brain damage. Uh, people were suffering uh, uh, the fear of police harassment and incarceration. So, uh, so really, naturally, this led to a greater frequency of negative effects. But then, as the 1970s came, and LSD was not uh, at the center of attention uh, anymore, the rate of bad trips plummeted, and according to Bunsa, this happened because of the change in the cultural setting. setting. So, the 1950s was uh, a very fruitful time uh, for the, our understanding of set and setting, and this happened simultaneously with the rise of hallucinogenic drug research, and uh, simultaneously and not coincidentally, as I would like to argue. Um, and by the end of the 1950s, in 1958, the World Health Organization published a report about hallucinogenic drugs, in which uh, they wrote about the dependence of hallucinogens on environmental factors and the context and constellation of conditions. So this was the World Health Organization, and, and, and this is a sign that by that time, the knowledge of the importance of non-drug factors, at least in the case of hallucinogens, was already becoming common knowledge in, in, uh, in certain circles of, uh, of medicine. So uh, when Timothy Leary arrived at the scene uh, in the early 60s, and Leary is the one that coined the phrase, uh, the concept of set and setting, uh, he wasn't really inventing anything new, he was get, just giving a catchy name to a uh, sentiment that was already receiving growing popularity, gaining growing popularity at the time. But uh, Leary did give exceptional attention to this idea. Uh, for example, in his paper, uh, Reactions to Psilocybin Under a Supportive uh, Setting, he made clear that the results that he got uh, were not, and that he published, were not um, true to psilocybin per se, but uh, were true when psilocybin is used in the specific set and setting conditions in which his research uh, was conducted. 
and like Wallace before him, Leary also um, also addressed the importance of uh, cultural controls. So uh, an idea, the idea that uh, researchers need to specify the kind of set and setting in which they got the results, and that researchers furthermore need to uh, variate and modify certain setting conditions. Uh, and so investigate the way that set and setting shape results and different set and setting lead to different kinds of results. So these were uh, very interesting ideas, but then they never came to bear fruit. And creating cultural uh, controls was very expensive. And it was not in the interest of the pharmaceutical industry that was more interested in uh, showing the effectiveness of its agents uh, than in uh, demonstrating their dependence on cultural factors. And since the 1960s and the cessation of psychedelic research into set and setting, and psychedelic research, the research on set and setting has also been put on hold, uh, more or less. Yet in the intervening time, the concept also continued to gain uh, currency and uh, become more and more used in uh, drug-using populations. And in recent years, with the rise, uh, with the return of, uh, of psychedelic research and with the continued uh, growth of uh, psychedelic uh, culture, there's also, it's also been receiving uh, growing attention and there are a number of, uh, of books that have been published and, and websites uh, that would uh, teach you on how to uh, build the right kind of set setting for a positive psychedelic experience. So overall, there seems to be a growing recognition of the importance of set setting. Okay, so um, what are really the prime factors of set settings? So, in my research, I, uh, which was um, on the 1950s and, 19, 1950s and 1960s research and uh, as viewed from the prism of set and setting, so I looked at what different investigators were saying on set and setting and what, uh, and the uh, different parameters of set and setting, and I uh, arrived at a list of 10 key variables of set and setting. It's difficult to say which is the most important one because you'll have like every time another researcher saying oh expectation is the most important or oh personality is the most important or, or social setting and so on and so forth uh, but really none of these factors is enough to ensure a positive experience but each of them is enough to turn an experience that could have been uh, marvelous into uh, um, uh, an excruciating affair so the first, uh, the first one is uh, personality. So what kind of person is having the experience? Uh, is this a um, neurotic person, a psychotic person, and a well-adjusted person if there isn't even, even is, if there is a, such a thing? Uh, is it if, if it's a well-educated person, if, um, if it's a young person or an older person? Uh, does this person have a tendency to paranoia or, uh, or anxiety? Um, do they need to have things in control? So all these are, are quite important. Then the second one is uh, preparation. So what kind of preparation do the person have? Are they aware, for example, of the range of, uh, of reactions or of experiences that uh, might be had? Under, hallucin under the effect of hallucinogens, did a person read any books about psychedelics? Um, did they maybe um, go on a certain diet to prepare themselves uh, before the experience? And I'm talking not about now the effect of the diet, but on the effect of having this intention built through doing something special before the experience, uh, taking a commitment. Uh, did the person maybe uh, follow a certain mental uh, practice before the experience? Um, so, or alternatively, maybe all, all they know about it comes from the papers. Then the third, uh, the third one is uh, expectation. So what kind of expectation does the person have? Uh, do they expect to work on a personal issue or uh, solve a scientific problem um, or have a full-blown mystical experience? 
or alternatively maybe they think that this experience is going to drive them insane uh, like many people uh, who participate in psychology medical research in the 1950s so uh, that could really uh, change a lot and and then some people might have no expectation at all because they're, they're they have been dosed without their knowledge which is really maybe the worst kind of expectation the non-expectation and then we have um, intention. So what kind of intention uh, does the person focus their energy towards a certain goal at, at all? And if so, which goal? Uh, then the physical uh, environment, uh, the fifth one, where, uh, where does the experience take place? Uh, in a lab, in nature, at home, in a church? In a museum? Uh, is this uh, an environment in which uh, one can uh, rest or uh, can, can, can the person uh, listen to music? Uh, are there intrusions in this environment? Uh, maybe the sound of phone calls, maybe people walking in and out. I'm, I'm going back again to these psychology medic researchers that, uh, you know, trip reports from the 50s of, uh, of people um, sitting in a mental ward and hearing the, the screams of, of uh, psychiatric uh, patients uh, while they're tripping and not, not very uh, conducive to positive experiences. Um, then the sixth one is the social environment. So does the experience first of all happen in a group or uh, for uh, an individual by themselves? And uh, if it's in a group, who are these other people? So are they uh, friends or uh, strangers? Maybe a lover or maybe a therapist? And what is the level of trust between the people uh, who share this experience together? Uh, seventh one is the cultural environment, which relates to those um, issues that I talked about before, the way the experience is conceived in the general culture. And, um, and whether it needs to be concealed and whether psychedelic experiences yeah, are punished and, and if there's an atmosphere of fear around such experiences. Then the eighth one is really uh, uh, relevant mostly to, uh, to research setting. It's the relationship between the researcher or, or the guide and the subject. So, um, so what kind of a relationship is it? Is it a egalitarian or authoritarian relationship? Is it a trusting relationship? Um, ninth one is the fair freedom. So um, also this is true uh, mostly in research, but not only in research in this case. Uh, so does the individual have to um, have to perform certain tasks or tests or can they just choose their own activities um, which would make the experience much more uh, enjoyable or have more potential to be pleasant. And then the last one is uh, metrics or support and this concerns the environment to which the individual returns after the experience. So does that environment, for example, support further growth uh, inspired by the experience or does it really maybe hinder such growth? So, um, so, so far we've covered um, the history of sense setting and uh, looked at the basic principles. But uh, another question is, uh, is this idea only limited to psychedelics, which is a relatively small field, or is it also true uh, to other drugs? So there's no doubt, uh, to my mind at least, that uh, the Sanusan principle is particularly uh, crucial in the case of psychedelics, uh, which as I said, uh, amplify and magnify meaning. Um, and um, as, as proof, uh, one could see uh, when we look at the fact that it emerged in the 1840s around hashish and then in the 1950s around um, around the LSD research and also in um, in shamanic rituals before, but uh, it's also relevant to other drugs and uh, can be used uh, also with other drugs. And over the past decades, we've we've had some research looking at the role uh, of certain setting. Uh, in shaping experiences with uh, alcohol and heroin and cocaine and retinoline and methamphetamine and uh, other drugs. And I want to talk about uh, two studies, particular studies that are uh, particularly instructive 
uh, instructing in in my um, in my mind and to my mind. Um, so the first one is a study by uh, Lee Robbins that was conducted uh, in the 70s. It's a classic one. Uh, so in the 1970s, uh, American soldiers in Vietnam, uh, America, uh, the American army had a big problem with the heroin use in Vietnam. So 35% of American soldiers are uh, estimated to have used heroin in Vietnam and a um, and great percentage of them using it, uh, developing independence and using it uh, on a habitual basis. Uh, the government was uh, very worried about that and they tried to tackle it by, um, by treatment but the, with very poor results, uh, they had some 90% recidivism rates. Um, so people were naturally very worried about what's going to happen once uh, soldiers got back home. But then uh, when, when American veterans returned, uh, something very surprising happened and 88% of them um, spontaneously and seemingly without effort stopped their heroin use. So what happened? How, how did this occur? And the answer lies, um, uh, according to, to Robbins also and, and, and other researchers, uh, in the setting in which uh, hero the heroin dependence uh, developed, so the setting of the Vietnam War was a setting of uh, um, not, well, not a very um, pleasant setting. Uh, the brutality of the war and and boredom and uh, ennui and the feeling of uh, meaninglessness and isolation and just a kind of life in which uh, one wants to. Uh, get away and uh, and maybe stop feeling or self-medicate uh, so that was very um, that led to a high rate of heroin use uh, but then as soldiers came home and these uh, conditions were no longer true then uh, they were able to uh, stop their use of the drug uh, as i said quite uh, quite easily uh, and they just uh, they re there was no longer a need for the drug because the conditions in which they lived no longer uh, made its use uh, necessary. Um, and another, um, another a very related experiment is the Bruce Alexander's Red Park experiment. Who knows the Red Park uh, story? Okay, nice. Um, so, um, so this experiment um, what well, Alexander, Bruce Alexander wanted to show really, uh, he was interested in how experimental conditions shaped the response of uh, lab animals to drugs. And his hypothesis was that um, classical studies about how drugs cause addictions, addiction that you looked at the um, drug used by animals in the lab were basically flawed. They were flawed because the setting in which uh, uh, animals became dependent on uh, on morphine in this case uh, or um, was a setting where um, where these animals lived in isolation in cages um, and they lived a very monotonous and boring life so in order to uh, try something else uh, Alexander and his uh, colleagues be built a very elaborate uh, environment full of uh, a rat heaven uh, or something like that, full of uh, opportunities for uh, social contact, for uh, mating opportunities um, with, uh, with some uh, uh, toys and with, um, with tunnels and uh, dark refuges to nesting. So it uh, provided a lot of positive stimuli or interesting things to do for, for, uh, for a rat uh, in, in, a, in a lab. Um, and what happened was that uh, there was really, uh, really very different uh, patterns of use that emerged in, in the rest that were part of, uh, part of Red Park. Uh, the rats that lived in solitary conditions used up to 19% more than a morphine than the rats that lived in, uh, in Red Park. And none of the rats in Red Park uh, developed a compulsive habit and uh, or overdosed most of them uh, preferred using and uh, drinking the plain water over um, water that was uh, laced with morphine. So, uh, so Alexander's uh, Red Park experiment really today is considered a, a classic of uh, addiction psychology 
and it has since been repeated with uh, cocaine and methamphetamine with uh, similar results. So, if we, if we look at um, if we look at the Red Park experiment, it really it explains a lot also about uh, the what happened with American uh, soldiers and how uh, and their addiction patterns uh, in Vietnam and once they got back home, and then it also explains a lot about the use of uh, uh, the use of drugs in uh, in in the urban ghettos and in slums and uh, which some have uh, compared to the kind of uh, environment where there is not much, uh, not much positive social stimuli and uh, a kind of like despairing environment where because of the environment, uh, becoming depend uh, drug use and uh, becoming dependent is, uh, becomes an easy option. So both the, the Red Park experiment and the Vietnam veterans um, study uh, change a lot of what we think and what our culture takes for granted about drugs and drug addiction. Our culture is deeply invested in the notion that um, drugs cause addiction. But uh, if simply changing the setting can, um, can get us better results than, uh, than the most treatment programs or even uh, all of them, then maybe we need to think, uh, rethink how, how we treat addiction. Mm, if drug effects are fundamentally shaped by non-drug factors, perhaps it means we need to invest a bit less in inventing new drugs and a bit more in studying the way that non-drug factors shape drug effects. Mm, in other words, what I want to say is that the rewards of tackling uh, questions of set and setting might might actually be considerably greater than the rewards of inventing new psychoactives, something that the pharmaceutical industry uh, has shied away from doing anyhow in uh, the recent years. Currently, it costs uh, more than a billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. Yet in 2011, um, the and, and most of the drug, by the way, are just. Uh, uh, rehashed versions of older pharmaceuticals whose patents have elapsed. So, uh, so th this leads to the need for new molecules with uh, very need uh, with, with very small uh, returns in in many cases or very small improvements in many cases. Um, so, in 2011, uh, in comparison to the one billion more than one billion for any uh, new uh, approved drug. Um, in 2011, the UK uh, drug education budget was less than a million pounds, and this was probably a good thing because uh, what is being passed around as drug education is usually just about scaring people about drugs and making drug users feel uh, guilty, pathetic, and worthless. So, still, what can we do to? change uh, and improve certain setting in our society in a way that would uh, minimize uh, dangers and harms and maximize uh, potential benefits. It might seem very difficult to change certain setting on such a, a large, uh, in such a, a large context in the cultural context, much more difficult than changing it in your home, own home or in your own mind. But there are already some initiatives that are working towards this aim. And um, I want to discuss five possible steps of, um, of towards creating a more beneficial, uh, better kind of uh, set and setting for drug experiences. So the first one would be uh, supporting psychedelic care services. So over the the last decades and particularly the last years, uh, psychedelic care services have become uh, increasingly popular. The most uh, famous ones are the Cosmic Care, uh, care Psychedelic Care Service, which uh, works in the Boom Festival, and uh, also the Zenda Project in uh, Burning Man. But such projects are really uh, these days being developed and uh, all around uh, the world coming uh, from, from Israel now. I can say that uh, there's one uh, existing in Israel over the past uh, 
um, three or four years and, and growing and now there's even a second and third one, the smaller one. So it's really a, a, a trend that's developing. And not only do these um, organizations um, help a lot of people who are having difficulties under uh, psychedelics resolve their, um, their difficulties in a, in, a, in a positive and often therapeutic ways, but they also generally promote um, a way of thinking about drug experiences that's uh, safer and more meaningful. Uh, they help people think about their experiences in a different way once they are uh, exposed to this different kind of, of, of setting and, uh, and approaching such experiences. Um, the second one would be to stop scare campaigns. And scare campaigns are harmful not only because they spread disinformation but also because they create a negative framework for drug experiences. So they paint drug uh, users as um, inherently dangerous losers and, um, and drug experiences as, uh, as fundamentally meaningless. And in this, they raise the, uh, the likelihood of negative experiences and they decrease the likelihood of meaningful experiences, they promote low self-esteem in users, and they generally uh, uh, promote a vulgar frame of reference uh, to thinking about mind-altering uh, experiences. The third one is uh, setting, setting education. So, so this is uh, about uh, educating people on how to create good and set and setting about even incorporating into their thinking, into their behavior and um, the way they conduct themselves with the psychoactives. And uh, psychedelic users are often uh, well aware of uh, the idea of set and setting and actually go to great lengths to, uh, to build a positive set and setting for their experiences. But still, this, this still remains a very minor phenomenon in the greater um, in the greater context not only of uh, the psychedelic uh, culture but also in the of the drug culture in general uh, and it might seem complicated uh, to change to to educate people about these issues but really uh, simple thumb rules such as uh, only do uh, in a good time with good people um, in a good place can really deliver the really deliver the message mm, in a in a very straightforward way and and people can by by just uh, having these kinds of slogans instead of uh, i don't know the just say no uh it, it's a lot more helpful for when people really encounter uh the dile dilemmas or the people have as as users of of, of drugs and really uh, there's not many people in this uh culture that don't use any drugs. And as I said, setting setting is, is, is relevant also to alcohol and it's relevant um, to rental and I think to, to, to almost, uh, to really to, to all psychoactives. Um, so here also there are already a number of organizations that are working in this direction and government needs to support such efforts. The fourth one is uh, setting setting research. So even though past research on the issue of non, uh, of non pharmacological factors uh, has showed a very interesting and a very um, really um, um, mind boggling um, um, results, uh, there have been relatively or uh, actually um, surprisingly few studies studying this. So this is uh, the difference is uh, when you when you compare this with the situation in placebo studies, which is another field that's uh, concerned with the role of non-drug factors in shaping reactions to drugs. In that case, uh, not only psychoactives but drugs in general. But in the case of placebo, there are hundreds of studies uh, being published about that and uh, and being conducted. And really, in the case of set and setting, there's almost nothing being done at the moment uh, which is uh, which is which is strange considering the the potential this has for really uh, helping people um, and changing the way uh, drugs are used in our society and the level of drug harms so 
we need to get back to Wallace's suggestion of cultural controls uh, of developing um, a system of, uh, of checking how certain setting shaped drug experiences in the lab in, uh, in, in drug research uh, today, but also how uh, non-drug factors shape reactions to drugs in the field across cultures and across subcultures. Um, like, for example, um, yeah, some people, there, there's this idea of methamphetamine as, as this um, demon drug and, and, the, and, and it's very, um, it's viewed always in relation with, uh, with ghetto use. And at the same time, you might have students using it in, in the US, I don't know about the UK, but using it and, and, and really, um, or, or even heroin and with totally different patterns. So, uh, and also, you, for example, benzodiazepines in Japan, people have different effects with benzodiazepines in Japan than they have uh, in, in the Western world. So really all of these cultural, subcultural uh, differences is something that I believe uh, is really worth looking at. And the fifth one is uh, changing uh, drug laws and cultural mores. And this is maybe the most ambitious one uh, and uh, changing drug laws in a way that um, that would minimize user anxiety about incarceration and about uh, unpleasant attention from uh, police officers and um, and even more crucially changing the way drugs are perceived in our society and uh, we were a long way off from the traditional uh, shamanic setting of using psychoactives um, but still, in recent years, we've seen the growth of uh, ayahuasca and different uh, ayahuasca circles and different uh, medicine uh, um, medicine sessions or, or, or ceremonies uh, where um, psychoactives and hallucinogens are used in a quasi-indigenous uh, context. So, um, returning to the indigenous, indigenous setting is... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's possible, uh, it's not clear if it's uh, desirable, but at the, certain, at the same time, the fact that these phenomena exist uh, show that there is a great interest in people uh, about trying, about using psychoactives with more meaningful, in more meaningful setting conditions, and, uh, and that there is a possibility of uh, encouraging uh, a more attentive and respectful use of psychoactives. So uh, I've presented uh, five steps to improving set and setting in uh, society. And some of them might seem uh, quite ambitious, uh, but at the same time, the, the nice thing about set and setting is that you can do it in, on many levels. You can do it uh, big or small. And uh, improving set and setting does not require full legalization. It does not require decriminalization. It's something that can be done uh, uh, regardless of the legal um, of the legal status of uh, psychoactives, and it's a path to preventing and uh, drug harms that works regardless of uh, how our society decides to regulate the use of these substances. Um, so. Um, so I'm going to uh, finish, uh, I've talked about the history of, uh, of set and setting, about how, uh, about their principles and about how we might improve set and setting uh, for, uh, for our society. And I believe that uh, by using uh, the principles of set and setting uh, intelligently, by incorporating them into our uh, drug research and drug policy, we can create a, a culture uh, in which uh, we reduce drug harms and in which we promote a more uh, beneficial um, uh, use of uh, psychoactives um, that, would, uh, that would be of more meaning uh, for people. Um, that's all. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the, from the audience at all?
psychiatric institutions back in the day the difficulty of that and the struggle with that yeah. and scientific trials promote that. What, what's your opinion? So I think that uh, researchers in the uh, field of psychedelic therapy have given a lot of thought to these uh, issues and uh, that basically, you know, by, by even going through this uh, checklist of, of 10 variables, one can look at any kind of research and, and see how uh, set and setting um, friendly it is, if we call it like that. And I think that uh, most researchers today are well aware of, of, these, uh, of these issues, uh, much more than, uh, than in the 50s, for sure, when the research on these substances has just begun. And still there are some issues that, um, that need to be uh, addressed. Uh, for example, uh, many times it was required uh, that uh, these kinds of experiments uh, should be conducted in a uh, hospital setting, so researchers do their best to make the, the environment as friendly as possible, or as, uh, yeah, as psychedelic as possible, but uh, it's also uh, it's a, it's a limitation that's, um, that's not necessary and, um, and maybe we could do away with it. Um, other problems is, uh, another uh, issue is uh, just uh, the extensive uh, use of um, of testing, which uh, the, the reason for testing in uh, in this research um, and sometimes uh, during the experience, so it's a certain uh, give and take uh, relationship where you need to see that uh, you do include uh, some tests maybe during the experience, but uh, but that it doesn't become the, the center of it, and um, in in um, also when you look at on some, some of the modern research that's being done today, a problem that didn't exist at the time, uh, if you think about um, some brain research with, uh, with fMRI, for example, where subjects need to uh, you know, be, uh, not move and be inside these machines. So it's also very uh, far away from uh, the ideal setting, setting, but then maybe you know, researchers try to tackle that by uh, I don't know, playing music inside there or, or just using uh, uh, people that are, um, I don't know, would be more accustomed to this situation, but th these are definitely issues that still, uh, that require a lot of thought still, yeah. It's, so, I, mean, I think it's quite interesting that um, psychedelics are, in a recreational setting, associated with uh, concerts and music festivals. You know, at Burning Man in Glastonbury and uh, the Grateful Dead and so forth. I recently heard a talk that Terence, Terence McKenna gave in which he said that, in his view, this environment was the worst environment to take to use these, these drugs. And from his perspective, having even one other person in your, in your company is, is a bad thing. And, um, you know, I, I think that's quite sort of interesting, those two kind of polar views on it. I don't know if there's been any, um, any studies looking at um, settings surrounding negative experiences. You know, and whether or not there is any surveys or research looking at people who have had negative experiences and what the setting was. Yeah, um, uh, well I think this, uh, this field is really developing at the moment it seems and uh, people in, uh, that work in uh, Cosmic Care and the Zendo project are also conducting research and there are starts in this, uh, these kinds of uh, environments supply uh, uh, ample opportunities uh, for for looking at these situations and you know with uh, with uh, cosmic care for example taking care of i think 400 uh, individuals each festivals so um um but i i don't know that uh, you know that we with that we at the moment uh, have um, have reliable data on these things but i think uh, that they're uh, that it's certainly coming just as a comment, I'd add to that, that if anyone is not aware of this, Cosmicare are operating in the UK as well, there's a UK branch of Cosmicare, so if anybody's interested in um, volunteering in sort of psychedelic support service at music festivals, they have a good website. Um, so you know, that might be something to look at if you're interested in that. Okay, okay. Any, any more questions? Yeah. I got, uh, yeah, just one question. Um, so <clears throat> there's a, the, the, the the, like the narrative of set and setting is mm -hmm. very hopeful and it's it's kind of like empowering and, 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 and giving the sensation of control. But what would you say are the limits of that? 
Yeah. And how, what is the appropriate narrative to frame that in terms of having a certain experience? And the appropriate narrative? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, even with certain setting, uh, nothing, is, uh, nothing is guaranteed. You could have uh, a terrible experience, basically. I mean, I guess if everything about the sense setting is, 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 is perfect or is, 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 is great, then, um, you know, then, then it will be a good experience. But uh, there are always uh, st uh, stuff that's outside of our control, even in the most controlled setting. You, you don't always control what might pop up in your mind or the kind of interaction that might happen even with a very close person. And um, there was this study by uh, Studerus uh, where um, from the Volenweiler uh, group in Zurich, and he uh, talked about all these um, all these reactions that were not explained by sudden setting, setting. And I think yeah, sudden setting, setting doesn't explain everything. And there's still a lot of these experiences are are yeah, they're not rocket science. As sudden setting, setting is not rocket science, and you cannot just you know uh, um, really you know, determine uh, specific rules and say this is what will come out. But still, uh, despite that, I think that it's, uh, it's uh, a great tool that allows to, uh, to forecast and to shape drug experience, drug experiences to a great extent. Yeah, well, yeah, some of the some of these uh, factors are more related to what happens before, like the expectation or the personality. But then uh, the social setting, um, I mean, it's uh, it relates to to how uh, to how things develop during the, the trip, and um, and you know also physical environment. It's something you know you you do it in a certain place, but then things happen during the experience that are also. And also, if I think, uh, you know, in James Fadiman's, uh, uh, the way he breaks this down in his uh, Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, so he has this, uh, I think, this uh, factor of, he calls it situation or something that, uh, about what particularly happens during the experience. But I think it's also covered in, in these variables that I've presented. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely that's a, a big, uh, a, a, a big thing, uh, um, and I mean, some setting changes between uh, one experience to the next. So I think there's a ne there's a component to it that really develops over uh, if a person is is uh, you know a psychedelic user that's going through these experiences uh, over a period of years, then his sense setting kind of develops as he uh, goes on this path. And also, um, really set and setting, uh, there's this kind of looping effect between, you know, drug experiences and, and set and setting. So, for also on a social and cultural level. So, for example, in the 1960s, uh, set and setting were shaping the experience in a certain way, but then uh, there, there um, a certain um, idea about what psychedelics are develops in the society, and this kind of uh, shapes the certain setting again. I mean, the the the, the society, sh the drugs shape the the the. Yeah, you get what I mean. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thank you. So, thank you, thank you, Rene.